Welcome to episode 16 of the Revolution Podcast, where I, your host Ryan, sit down with industry experts to discuss the latest trends in e-mobility, clean tech, and the future of transportation. Today I'm joined by Felix Hamer, EV travel hacker and e-mobility enthusiast, who through his website electricfelix.com shares his EV trips around Europe, as well as EV travel advice and travel guides. Into the episode we go. Thank you for joining the podcast, Felix. It would be great to start with a small introduction about yourself before we get into the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for uh, inviting me over here. And the the thing is that it 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 all happened sort of yeah by by accident. And I I I used to travel a lot, and I I, I still try to, but right now it's a bit more difficult. And the thing is that I never owned a car. Uh, I just had a motorbike. Um, so for all my trips, I used to rent vehicles and the thing that mostly happened is just that, yeah, in the Netherlands, it's been possible to rent electric vehicles for a couple of years now, which made me try them out. And yeah, I just found out that they were much more fun than people back then were saying, uh, that was true. So yeah, I, I had no choice but to use them to try anything that I could think of. And just, I, I noticed that these fast charging networks that in the Netherlands, uh, Fastnet has been present for uh, for over seven years now, but in many countries, it's still like almost just starting. Um, so we, yeah, in the Netherlands, we had this, uh, we had, we were in a different phase, um, but yeah, the pleasure is really in this, uh, this adventure that's sort of, yeah, starts as soon as you cross the border. Yeah, and I think that's quite a unique way of getting into EVs and exposing you as much as possible, as you've been able to try a vast number of electric vehicles because you didn't purchase one in the first place. So when did the interest in EVs begin? Was there a specific moment or event that sparked your interest? Yeah, so what <clears throat> what happened back in 2013 is that in Amsterdam, there was um, the, the e rally. And this was organized by a private party, actually. And there were a couple of chargers already in Amsterdam because the local government uh, already got into electric vehicles in 2012, I believe. And um, I won uh, I won a ticket to participate uh, because it was meant uh, for people to sh- sort of show off their electric vehicles. I, I guess there were a couple of hundreds or maybe maybe thousands in the Netherlands. Um, so the, the, the public was still very, uh, very small and I gained, uh, an entry ticket and they promised me that I could drive an electric car. Um, and I was sort of disappointed because they gave me the car to go that just started, I think half a year before in Amsterdam, uh, which is this uh, shared program, um, that in Amsterdam, uh, back then was 300 electric smarts. Uh, cruising all around town that you could just uh, hop into with your uh, smartphone. So when they promised me a Leaf or a Zoe and I got the smart and I got in with one of my best friends, Hugo, that I uh, later did many uh, travels with. And the thing is that, yeah, I, I, I thought like, is this even a car? Okay. It has four wheels, but we only fit the two of us not a a lot of luggage space but the thing is that yeah over the course of the day i was so surprised that this yeah this vehicle that is sort of the size of my bike uh, already had a battery to power us all around town and even outside of it and this is uh yeah clearly a long time ago now so it, it did prove to me that yeah wow you can put a battery into a small car and then just race around. And I was really surprised by the power that it could even go more than a hundred kilometers per hour, which we tried uh, for a little bit on the highway, even at the end of the day. Um, so that was the first surprise. And uh, the thing is back then, uh, car to go specifically, they had this um, reward uh, for connecting it to a charger if the, if the battery level was below 30%. So what I did then, uh, is that I g- went all around town. I lived in the center already, uh, which was the area with the most dense uh, charging locations in, in Amsterdam. Uh, it still is, uh, but it was already uh, at a different scale. 
And I just plugged in all these vehicles that other people just left around the center with 34%, 33%. I just raced them a bit from traffic light to traffic light and then connected them to the charter, which gained me hours and hours of free driving. So for a couple of years, I used to drive a lot around town with the car to go. But the thing is that this didn't open my eyes to the fact that you could also just go anywhere yet. Um, because I tried to connect uh, the, the electric smart to Fastnet, for example, um, and uh, and that didn't work because they don't uh, the, the smarts don't do fast charging. And for me, yeah, everything really started a couple of years later um, because I actually won uh, a day on an electric motorbike uh, from a rental company that I was following that rented out Teslas but they talked to this uh, guy that rents out electric motorbikes. I didn't even know about electric motorbikes. I just thought I would have a good chance of winning because most people would just try to win the Tesla. So I wanted to be in a competition with less people. And I actually won this. Uh, this and, and then, yeah, I could connect the motorbike to Fastnet, which the smart couldn't. And connecting this motorbike to Fastnet on the way back from the beach um, and then just realizing that, yeah, after 10 minutes, I could just race myself home. Uh, and, and this battery pack was just between my legs because you're on this small motorbike. It's relatively heavy, but the battery pack is physically very small. Then I started to understand, like, wait a second, this infrastructure that Fastnet's putting out there actually works. And I could buy this motorbike four years ago and go all around the country already, thanks to the infrastructure. Like it really clicked in my head that this infrastructure thing and this battery is recharging fast. They're they're connected in a way that is yeah, it's not like going for gas with a car. It's uh, it's really something new entirely. That's really fascinating, and I'm really beginning to notice that you're someone who has a unique entry into the EV space through these different competitions. And there's definitely something entrepreneurial about your strategies. It's also intriguing that you mention electric motorbikes. Given there is still a large majority of people who consider an EV to solely be a car, when it can obviously be other modes of electric transport too. Are electric motorbikes still a passion of yours today? No, so the thing is really that, yeah, why my blog is called Electric Felix because it's me doing electric stuff. Um, and even though, uh, yeah, some of my, uh, my, my, uh, my happiest blogs are with long car trips uh, and travels, um, the thing is that for me, the important part is really that this electrification is happening anywhere. And if I look around here in Amsterdam, I see a lot of electric cars. They're really, they're just everywhere. There's so many charging points uh, and it's still growing. The thing is that if you look closely to the, actual traffic in the city then you will see even more electric bikes than you will see electric cars but they just don't make a big impression because there's no sound people are still pedaling like they were not usually so you don't know most of the elect electrification in a city like amsterdam you don't even notice because it's just yeah people are riding their buck feet and their uh, their other crazy bikes and they, they 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 sort of still look exactly the same but they have a battery hidden somewhere uh, with van Moof, this is uh, very obvious of course like they really try to hide it well um uh, but i noticed that they're just everywhere and and my blog really wants to focus on on anything so i want to show you the bikes i want to show you the motorbikes i want to show you the fast chargers i want to show you that it's cheap because the thing is, I don't own a car. I don't look forward to owning a car. Yet I make all these trips. And so can you. And you don't need to have the car for it. You can just rent one, go for a trip, and be happy again because you don't need to have it around the, the city when you're back home. Yeah, and personally, I completely agree with the ownership side of things too. I think with the rise of car sharing, we're going to see less and less people owning cars, and that happens to coincide with the rise of EVs too. There are a ton of other benefits too, like being able to drive more expensive cars and then share your experiences with your audience on your blog. So on that note, let's delve into the blog, because you've definitely found a niche that I haven't seen before. And I think you're really filling a gap when there are still thousands of EV owners who are hesitant about using their car outside of cities, 
because of different concerns including charging infrastructure, range anxiety, etc. Perhaps many of these concerns are valid, particularly in non-developed countries, but I'm intrigued to know about your blog, electricfelix.com. Of course, yeah. So what what mostly happened is that I um, uh, found out that one of my favorite rental companies uh, suddenly had the Jaguar I-Pace available at the end of 2018, this was. And before this happened, they already had the e-Golf, they already had the BMW i3. Um, so I took those out for a spin in the summer. And it's funny because taking the BMW to Paris with this friend of mine that I already mentioned, Hugo, uh, we went to Paris and it was sort of a disaster. It was really a try to, can we do this? My friend has a birthday party there. Um, and I, yeah, uh, this was like a couple of months after the electric motorbike trip. And I really wanted to try to see how far I could actually go. Uh, and yeah, back then there was uh, not much else available, at least not at a, at a normal price. Like you could already rent Teslas in the Netherlands, but as you say, uh, yeah, they have this idea of being super premium when to me, yeah. Um, I, I don't, well, some part of it is premium, I guess, but, um, that, 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 yeah, that's not my thing. I, I, I'm not like people will, will look at my blog perhaps, and they see me driving a really expensive vehicle. Uh, But the thing is that I try to do it at the lowest price because I, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't make a fortune and I don't even intend to. Uh, yet I still want to travel a lot, but I will just visit friends and and do all kinds of tricks to just uh, make it affordable. Um, and the thing is that when um, when we did this trip to Paris, we really encountered all these issues when we started crossing the border. So the first chargers that were acting up uh, was in the middle of Belgium, but then in Belgium afterwards, you still feel lucky because you get to France. And that is really when adventure starts because any charger can be broken. It can be weirdly functional. It can be delivering half the power. It's promising while you pay by the minute. So extra painful. Um, so all these weird things started happening. But the thing is that the, the fun is also in that uh, if you do make it to Paris, then you can just connect to the power outlet of the friends we were visiting so we were charging on the on the Seine River actually um, at the Shuko power plug, and then that will get you a big head start to get pretty far. Uh, and you can even with the BMW i3 back then, you can nearly make it to Belgium on that uh, on that free energy from from uh, Paris. Uh, and the thing is that when you do make it back then you start to really appreciate the infrastructure that Fastnet back then had already up and running in the Netherlands. Because as soon as you uh, are out of Belgium uh, and back in the Netherlands, you notice that, wow, in the Netherlands, it was already so easy uh, back then, um, which convinced my friend Hugo that he should immediately get rid of his uh, BMW that was still uh, running on fuel uh, and switch to the Hyundai Ioniq. Uh, which uh, arrived a couple of months uh, later, and we we used it for some other trips that I will get into at a different point. But the thing is that um, this was the last time that we did a, a, a bigger trip with the BMW, and then I suddenly found out that Sixth uh, started to rent out the Jaguar I-Pace, um, which I didn't even know about. Like Some people were already looking forward to that car for years because they've been into electric vehicles for longer because they were really yeah, looking forward to these uh, big battery vehicles. But back then, it was like the sort of the first uh, competition to Tesla in that it had uh, fast charging capabilities that were more serious than before, that had a bigger battery than before, and that it was really this luxurious European vehicle. Um, so I was really happy that uh, that it was available for rent. And back then I still had an office job, so I took a break from that. And um, thanks to another guy, uh, Martin, who runs a website very interesting uh, called Laadpas Top 10, uh, which is I think now also available in English at oldchargecards.com. And um, this guy uh, knows everything for years already about charging cards and traveling around Europe. What I'm also interested in, but what he's really like, he's checking on the technical specifics and the 
he has a very interesting website about this uh, this topic solely. And the thing is that he uh, advertised this German charging card that I could sign up for, and I paid like 30 euros. Um, it was the MindGal Plus card back then that they were trialing um, to see if you could charge without limits for a while. So I had that card. I got the rental car from uh, from from six. It was the Jaguar I paid. And I went to Germany and I just did circles from Berlin to Munich to Frankfurt uh, to Konstanz, visiting friends that I have in all these places and making some new friends, uh, doing couch surfing and everything. And and I just raced the autobahn and I made some YouTube movies that are still some of my uh, my best viewed uh, films because yeah, the thing is that uh, back then this. Yeah, the charging at the new new Honda charger in Frankfurt and stuff. It was all like it was really you had to find these couple of spots. Fastnet just had five stations or six up and running in Germany. And there wasn't that much choice. And yeah, you needed to be uh, sure where you were going because yeah, anywhere could be the last uh, working charger back then. But yeah, it was really um, uh, yeah mind-blowing experience because it also showed me that if you have these routes if you go from frankfurt to munich for example this is a couple of hundred kilometers so if you time it well you just need this one fast charger in the middle and then you can do the whole trip and even at german speed if the weather isn't uh, too horrible so yeah i i really uh, that it opened my eyes to the the, the change that one fast charging location brings as long as you can trust that location that it has a couple of working chargers hopefully maybe even offering different speeds and stuff um that these differences are so huge because yeah back then it was really just starting out in germany that more and more stations were popping up um so i visited some stations that were yeah just up and running for a week or two weeks but they really opened this whole new trip that before would have been much slower because you would have to have gone gone to a local supermarket to survive and suddenly you had a couple of highway uh, capable uh, chargers and yeah that that got me um in the right direction back then i was just sharing this on instagram and i joined the facebook group where all the dutch ipace owners uh, were gathering and that really got this conversation going that Yeah, I was I was already traveling a lot with the iPads, and and some people were just receiving this vehicle that they maybe ordered a couple of years ago. Um, but but you notice that yeah, most people would just use it to drive drive around the Netherlands. So I was one of the first to actually go very far, show them that it was possible, and it it got me uh, well connected in this community that yeah that that feels like friends now. Um, And yeah, one of these guys actually invited me for lunch one day and he just told me like, yeah, what you're doing is great, but yeah, you need to share this. You're gathering all this knowledge and you need to share it. So that, that really got me uh, going. And in, in 2019, I uh, started the, the actual blog that is uh, electricfelix.com. And I started writing about doing these trips and how I would plan it and uh, and sharing more of this so i yeah i started to rent uh, the ipads nearly every other month and just doing uh, crazy adventures with them. well i have a lot of follow-up questions based on that one question that i'm yet to ask any guest about is regarding charge cards and the role they play in e-mobility as a petrol car driver no such thing exists as you will simply drive to your nearest petrol slash gas station and fill up the tank with evs things are a little different For our listeners, would you be able to explain how charge cards work and how they might be applied to different countries and providers? Well, the, the charge cards are a really interesting topic. And yeah, they they, uh, they create a lot of discussion, of course, and even, even uh, yeah, obviously between petrol and going electric. But even within just the electric uh, scene, uh, this is a, an amazing uh, discussion point. And the thing is that, yeah, what... There, there's a couple of things um, next beside each other uh, that are interesting to look at, and and the thing is mostly that that yeah the the change from petrol to electric is such a yeah it is a very diverse one because 
because of that you're able to put electricity in your vehicle yeah a lot of people even in europe will be able to put their own electricity in to their own vehicle uh, so that already creates this um, some people will yeah depending on where you go with your electric vehicle you might run completely independent of uh, big companies and uh, and whatsoever and it's it's really that clearly when you go on a big trip like i do sort of all the time then um yeah you get into this uh, charting card madness because clearly if you're far away from home and you find yourself um in the neighborhood of a charger might be an ac charger might be a dc fast charger then suddenly it yeah it's depending on which company operates this machine but yeah it might even be interesting who made the machine and then who put the machine there and everybody's trying to get yeah everybody wants your data so a lot of charging uh, locations will ask you to sign up for their app and if you don't then you need to enter all your details all the time so that's also annoying um, so a lot of things uh, happen at the same time and this is where for me as a I'm also for my whole life I've been a bargain hunter and the thing is that what 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 petrol people I don't I, I think don't realize is that bargain hunting for petrol I mean sure um, my dad always used to go to the petrol station in Amsterdam that he knows as cheap and I know some stations who are just popular for their price but these people don't realize that this this 10 cent change for petrol uh, if you look for the right station to actually charge your electric vehicle the price difference might be as big as just charging up for free and clearly that is the most crazy bargain of all so at the at the one side you have all these people complaining about using the wrong charging card might end up in a very expensive charging session especially if you're far from home in a different country um, but the thing is that also like imagine driving your electric vehicle from amsterdam to barcelona which i accidentally also did but anyway if you did that two years ago then what most people don't realize is if you did that two years ago then arriving in barcelona uh, you would need a certain app to charge up so absolutely if you came there with your regular dutch charging card then uh, that it would it would have wouldn't have been possible to charge using that charging card that you brought from home but if you look at the machine if you speak a bit of spanish you find out what app you can use for the barcelona region and back then for a couple of years running it actually stopped this year it was possible to charge up in the whole region of barcelona at dc fast charger delivering 50 kilowatts stable for free so arriving in barcelona and driving around the whole region from beach to beach from supermarket to supermarket from friend to friend from hotel to hotel whatever you want we drove around the whole week over a thousand kilometers paying nothing and of course we had to download this very specific spanish app to make it work but then it actually worked it worked everywhere it worked for free and we had the most joyful week of june uh, i i ever remember in spain so yeah the, um, it is not without its complications because in some places you will absolutely need a local charging card or app um and this is one of the topics that i write constantly about and i have a couple of specific pages on my blog set up to just show people which apps are the best to use and nowadays and and what what is maybe even the most important here is that nothing is stable so this scene is still at the be at the very beginning even now and this means that in the meantime just in the if i look at the past two years i've started to use some german charging cards that used to be very cheap and nowadays one of these charging cards doesn't even exist anymore so what i used to recommend to people two years ago 
right now, if they try to use the same thing, then suddenly it won't work anymore. And sure, they got one email to tell them that it wouldn't work anymore, but one email, easy to miss. So yeah, that is really one of the biggest things to realize. Like if you absolutely don't want to get into things, then maybe it is too early for you. On the other hand, you have a couple of charging cards like new motion and plug surfing who are definitely some of the biggest in Europe now that will instantly give you access to over 200,000 chargers in Europe. And it will pretty much always work. Of course, maybe not always at the best price. So yeah, do you want convenience? Just get these two cards and I'm pretty convinced you can make it to Sicily from Amsterdam. But will it be at the best price? Well, maybe you should read my blog if you want to be sure of that. Thanks for the explanation. And it is good to know that you're providing all this information about charge cards on your blog so that people don't have to be concerned and confused before and even during a trip. So when you're planning a trip from, say, Amsterdam to Barcelona, are you a big planner before you start your trip, ensuring you know where you'll charge your car on every specific day, which could actually be a big put off for prospective EV drivers? Or are you someone who prefers to work it out as you go? And maybe that even gives you some excitement as there's that element of the unknown. For me, it's really a combination. So I like to plan ahead in the sense that I read about all these charging cards and apps all the time. So I try to look on um, one of my favorite apps is Charge Map that really shows you a well, uh, well laid out web of uh, especially the fast chargers in Europe. And that actually has a big community sharing do these chargers work? What charging card did people use? Did they get the right speed? Um, so that's a really interesting functionality that many charging apps still lack. Uh, they just show you if a charger is maybe available, but then, yeah, you still don't know um, what, what will actually happen if you're there. So I try to look ahead for these things, but what I also really love is just to drive and see what happens. So when I have some of these apps on my phone, and especially if I'm driving with a friend that is open to these kind of things, like Hugo in his Hyundai Ioniq, uh, we just, yeah, we start to travel south. We know we want to end up in the Barcelona region and we see what happens. And it, yeah, that, that's really my favorite style, but my blog uh, also changed into really um, uh, a travel guide part where I uh, write about uh, uh, spe specific uh, strategies to use in different countries, uh, what charging cards to prepare for the different countries. And um, I have many clients that I, I help uh, travel, uh, plan their travel ahead. And then depending on their vehicle, depending on the weather we expect, depending on how many kilometers they like to do on a day or how many hours they like to travel on a day or where their preferred hotels are, um, we base a very uh, strict plan of you will drive around 120 kilometers per hour. You will arrive with around 10% at the charger. Uh, you can stay for half an hour or a little bit more if you want. Um, so it, 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 it really depends uh, on, the, on the profile also because, yeah, obviously if you're driving around with your whole family, if you bring little kids or if you have a specific time that you need to be somewhere, then, yeah, you're off, yeah you need to plan that a bit to make it work. Um, but personally, if I have the chance, I love to just actually like I used to go for a drive and see what happens and that way also make discoveries that I didn't plan ahead, um, which might be good or bad discoveries, but I'm always learning. So I'm always open to, uh, to some obstacles also. Yeah. And I was just going to say, it really just depends on your intention for the trip. Is the drive the holiday or is the destination the holiday? So how about we dive into some of the trips you've been on? On your website, electricfelix.com, you've documented quite a few different trips, for example, Madrid, Barcelona, Copenhagen, Wales. But I'll let you decide which stories you'd like to discuss on the podcast. And I'm sure our audience can find out about the rest on your website. Yeah, there's, there's always more uh, stories to tell. But since you are actually from the UK and, um, and our, the, the trip to Wales was quite legendary because... Uh, this was uh, back in early 2019, so it was still 
I think it was only the third time that I uh, that I took the Jaguar I Pace for a spin. And back then I had a friend living in uh, London. Uh, so what I did is I took my friend Hugo in the Jaguar and we drove over to London together where we picked up my other friend who then had this yeah, sort of semi-planned uh, idea of how we would drive around England and at least uh, visit Snowdonia. And it was back in February and I was driving this Jaguar i but it was this rental vehicle that I think was meant for a summer delivery in the Netherlands, but by now it was clearly winter and half a year later. So I, it was on big summer wheels and then the snow came when we left London uh, and the predictions were also that it would be pretty wild, uh, but I didn't really, I, I, I just didn't wanna wanna believe that it would be as wild as some of these predictions were and I was just curious about the local charging infrastructure. Back then, um, mainly uh, this uh, company Polar uh, was putting out uh, 50 kilowatt chargers around the UK, uh, like pretty well spread out. And um, so I had specifically uh, lined up some chargers on, uh, on my favorite app for the UK, which is ZapMap. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, not anybody should drive around the UK without that app on their phone, no matter their kind of electric vehicle. And the thing is that, um, yeah, this showed, showed us some interesting chargers, but they were not on the, on the highway at all. So I also, and I, I always like to leave the highway because you see way more. And, and the thing is that even though, um, England is, yeah. I feel like one of my neighboring countries uh, because of the water, it's always a bit of a, of a, of a thing to get there by car. Um, and yeah, as a bargain hunter, it's also difficult because yeah, getting on this boat or this train, is really hard to do for a very sharp price. So you sort of need to fill up your car a bit with people for it to be sensible. Uh, I, I absolutely don't like to drive empty cars anyway. So the thing is that this time I was with friends and we made it over. But then, yeah, when we were on the local roads and we weren't even close to Wales yet, uh, it just started to snow like crazy. And luckily, the Jaguar I-Pace uh, uh, has two motors. So you have front and uh, rear wheel drive. Um, so in the beginning, when all the snow was fresh, yeah, it handled well. And I was really surprised, like, wow, am I really on summer tires? I feel so powerful. And then, yeah, you know, one hour in, two hours in, we get to this roundabout. It gets a little bit busy on the road. And, yeah, I try to brake a little bit. And, yeah, so the car doesn't brake. And we just slide into the roundabout. And I see this BMW M5 getting closer and closer. And I need to take the roundabout the other way than I'm used to. So that's also a bit of a, of a thing. And yeah, I, I'm very happy that we didn't um, bump into each other, but it was so close. And then um, leaving the roundabout, which we just barely survived, it was just minutes later that a tree nearly fell through the panel roof of the Jaguar. So then I looked at my friends and I was like, okay, what can we do? Because staying on this road is just amazingly dangerous. And um yeah, so my friends, I was lucky. So this is also a thing, like if you're alone behind the wheel of an electric vehicle, then you will experience this moment that you're looking for this charger and that it's hard to actually make it work. Um, so I really suggest that you park it on the side of the road and just look for something if you're alone. Uh, but luckily I had friends uh, with all these apps on their phones and being happy to look around. So they actually found us a hotel which was very nearby that had Tesla destination charger. And it was the first time that I connected to such a charger and that I found out that as long as, um, as a place that has these chargers set up, if they have more than one, then one of them will be Tesla only and the other one will serve every vehicle. Uh, so we connected the Jaguar to the Tesla charger and it worked. And yeah, we were, we had the best parking spot right in front of this beautiful hotel, even though you couldn't see a thing because of all the snow, 
but um, yeah, it was uh, still an amazing uh, memory because yeah, the weather was just so wild. We were driving this super expensive car on summer wheels, and yeah, it was. Uh, I'm I'm really happy that we just yeah we got lucky in all senses, and we and we were together, and it uh, it created this even stronger brotherhood feeling of surviving in the snow. But yeah, so I recommend to get winter tires if you can. And, uh, and yeah, to really just uh, take it slow. But I was happily surprised back then that um, this uh, company Polar that I talked about before, uh, even in Wales where, yeah, especially fast charging is very difficult to find, uh, even now. Um, but I, I, I forgot about uh, the company's name, but there is a company, you can find it on my Twitter account, that recently uh, put out uh, even 100 kilowatt uh, charger in Wales. So some things are happening there. But back then I was already really happy that we found this 50 kilowatt charger um, because yeah, you just, uh, uh, back then we could uh, chill at, uh, at a nearby uh, restaurant, bar, uh, shop combination thing that had this charger outside the door. And, yeah, I, I know that in uh, in England there's also some pubs who put out 50 kilowatt charging and stuff. And now you have nowadays you have companies like Instavolt that if you actually run a hotel, restaurant, shop, whatever, and you have some of your own terrain, you can just call them up and they will put these fast chargers right in front of your your spot. So yeah, I know that in uh, in England some really interesting stuff is going on. You have a company like GridServe that is. Yeah, just uh, showing uh, a very interesting path. I'm super curious uh, how the speed of their rollout will be. And they just uh, formed this combination with uh, the electric highway network. And so that should mean a lot of upgrades. I, I cannot wait to come back to England, England and see for myself what's changing because, yeah, there's so much happening there. And I really like this... Um, I think this difference between France and England is so interesting to look at because obviously they're even more connected neighbors than I think the, the, the Netherlands and England is. And, and it's so interesting to me that in a company like France, that is, I think, even bigger and has maybe even more cars. Well, I'm, I'm not sure of the actual numbers, but yeah, nobody can live without a car in either of these countries, sort of, if they live outside of the city. And you see this totally different approach of in, in England, all these companies are fighting for all these new EV drivers. And in France, I can still drive around and just yeah, look around. Where are these fast chargers? Where are these companies putting them everywhere? I'm still, I'm still searching. So it's, uh, yeah, I see some really big differences that are so interesting to look at. But then if you do hit this French village, where there's a, a mayor who believes in EVs, they put a charger there right next to the to the local government capital, and then yeah, at night the charging will be free. Uh, yeah, they they serve way bigger power. Like in France, 22 kilowatt charging is very normal in the streets, and they have all these Renault Zoe's that can actually use it. In the Netherlands, quite impossible to find a 22 kilowatt charger almost. So there's yeah, the differences, it, it's just amazing. You cross one border and everything will change. The names of all these companies, what are they interested in? Do Will they do AC charging? Will they do DC charging? Will they believe in putting lots of DC fast charges out there? Will they put a roof over it? Yeah, and, and then in, in companies like, in uh, countries like France, England, or even uh, Germany, you also have all these regional differences. So if you visit Hamburg, it's 10 times easier to charge up your car than Berlin. Or if you go to Frankfurt, there's there's less chargers in Frankfurt than in one of my neighborhoods in Amsterdam. And it's just, yeah, it, it's just amazing that as, as soon as you start traveling, anything might change after 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, the, the landscape will, will, will change completely. and. Yeah, this is, yeah, to me, this is such an interesting thing to look at because there's so much happening all the time. So that's also why I'm trying to keep up uh, with my newsletter to tell people what's happening, to find help find them the best deals, but to also just show them, yeah, like traveling around England this year, 
when it's allowed again, it will be 10 times easier than just last year. And the same is happening in Germany. Like the amount of fast chargers that are being put out there is just staggering. And the announcements of more chargers and more chargers, yeah, it's only going up from here. Some really great insights there. And I can hear the passion in your voice for the developments that are happening or will happen in the near future within the industry. And you've also partly answered my next question about some of the differences you've noticed between each country you've traveled to. Perhaps you could highlight some of the EV-friendly countries or not so EV-friendly countries that you visited in the past. Well, so there's a couple of things always happening at the same time. And and now, now it's super interesting, I think, because uh, as I just talked about, in some countries, the amount of new fast chargers being put on the road is, is really amazing to me. Uh, because the the tempo is is really going up and yeah like last year there were already a lot of things happening but this year it, it seems like even more is happening the thing is though that one should never forget that that the ba- the base le- level should really be in ac charging being very omni omnipresent because you really need to wake up with a full charge if you drive an ev if you wake up and your vehicle is not charged it's really weird to start a trip and the first thing you need to do is look for a fast charger that's not how you start your day so and that is really something that is absolutely not a big story when i think it should be one of the biggest stories and uh, in a in a simple uh, example if you visit berlin or hamburg which i do all the time then yeah just finding your ac charger might be very difficult because of the combination of yeah there is not enough infrastructure there is quite some local demand also because some uh, car sharing companies are using quite a bit of the infrastructure that is there so you are in competition with all these shared vehicles which to me is very weird and I don't understand how the local government allows um, all these electric vehicles to enter the streets when they don't have the infrastructure set up to make it, uh, yeah, make it a logical thing. So they sort of expect these companies to take care of the things themselves. But in a city that is not, yeah, that's not how you do things. You these cars need to be charging all the time, and yeah, so you need to build that infrastructure and. You, you cannot ask a company to do this because it's in the public uh, space. So it needs to be local government that puts this in place. And in Amsterdam, uh, yeah, some of these cities should really talk more to Amsterdam uh, to see how they manage to make this work. Because over here, before uh, a huge fleet of electric vehicles arrived, uh, a shared fleet arrived last year, just before they added hundreds of AC chargers uh, to make sure that there was actually space for them to charge. Uh, and the thing is that most of the time, uh, any electric vehicle doesn't need to be charged because it will always be charged yesterday or because it's away from empty yet or because you don't have a big trip plan. But uh, yeah, the biggest uh, things is just that, yeah, in a country like Germany, fast charging nowadays is easier than ever before and it will just get easier from here because there's way more announcements coming all the companies that were already doing a lot of things in germany they will do more this year so all these companies are growing their network uh, both in capacity and in speed but the thing is that's not the full story so even though i could absolutely recommend traveling through germany with an electric car and i think it's now one of the easiest and one of the cheaper countries to travel in with an electric vehicle and a lot of fun because of the autobahn because you can try your maximum speed because and that's an easy combination with maximum charging speed because if you heat up the battery nicely charging curve will also get better so that that can be a great combination but the thing is if you get then drive into the city or a village in germany and then finding a charger that is available that you have a working charging card for might still be a challenge. So it is hard for me to recommend one spot because yeah, even though like if we look at Austria, for example, a neighbor of uh, Germany, they have quite some charge. They're not a very big country. They have a dense fast charging network. 
They have some AC charging infrastructure also set up. But over there, for example, it's really easy to run into a very expensive uh, spot to charge. So even though it might be easy when you get to Vienna to charge your car, it might also cost you a fortune. Same happens in Copenhagen. If you visit Copenhagen, chargers are everywhere, but only the locals can sign up for a really good charging deal. And if I, as a tourist, enter Copenhagen and I just use a random charging card at a random charger, I might go broke just charging my my cheap electric vehicle. So yeah, there are some really weird things going on that shouldn't be um, because it's very weird that a local would pay half price from a tourist. And yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's the same energy. Um, and uh, so, so a lot of things still need to improve. But um, yeah, the, the, what I like, what I think is really cool is that visiting countries like France, Germany, but England just as well, is that there's all these remote places you can visit. There's way more forest in Germany or France or England than in, than in the Netherlands. And even if you just rent a, a hut in the middle of the woods, as long as there's you know two solar panels on that hut, then you can just connect to the Shuko charger and drive around the forest the whole week and you don't need that fast charger. You don't even need that AC charger. Just a regular plug will serve you well as long as you don't do big miles and you just do local roads, low speed. It's uh, summertime, nice temperature outside. And then now, now, only now, there will be some vehicles coming with their own solar panels on the roof. So putting it just on the beach, on the parking spot, it will be charging up even without being connected. So, and, and this is only, again, just the beginning because obviously it can only get crazier from here. Great, thanks Felix. Let's go into some quick fire questions to finish. First off, what is your favorite EV? Oh yeah, yeah, such a tough question. No, 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 I will say the Hyundai Ioniq and I mean the old one because it is it, it has the best consumption of any EV that I've driven. And um, yeah, I really think that there's, uh, there's not enough attention on uh, consumption because yeah, at the end of the day, that matters a lot. If we all consume a bit less, then that yeah, makes life better for everyone. Nice. So for the second question, how important is charging infrastructure in your opinion? And if you had to give a percentage split between the importance of EVs versus charging infrastructure, how would you judge it? Well, I absolutely think that yeah, the future is where it begins. Like if, if in a city, if a city wants to go electric and they don't put a ridiculous amount of AC chargers out there at the right price, then they're simply doing it wrong. Infrastructure comes first because then the EV can connect to it and can go anywhere. Uh, so I would say like a 60-40 split because you also want the EV to charge at high speed or you know have the right consumption but uh, infrastructure absolutely comes first for me okay next question in your opinion what is the biggest misconception about evs yeah i still when i'm charging up even far away from home people ask me how far can you go uh, and they probably mean on one charge or whatever but to me this question is so hilarious because they mostly ask me this question when I'm a thousand kilometers from home or more. So I just want them to read my stories and find out that I'm looking forward to drive to Georgia with whatever EV I can get my hands on that will have insurance to go there. Uh, I think anything is possible. You can go as far as you want. Just take some time. I agree. What other things do you do that you would consider sustainable on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mention it because driving electric, it really changes uh, your mindset. I think nearly automatically, especially when you do as much fast charging as I do, you start to realize what's going on when you move yourself around with this vehicle. So, and this is what I really like about the, the two wheel vehicles that I drive or recently the three wheel vehicle, my newest block will be a three wheel vehicle block. And, and I love that they can consume so little energy for transporting me sometimes even all around the country. 
um, with so little weight and so little effort. But I, I really love to use an app called Too Good To Go, um, which uh, helps you save food that would otherwise just get thrown away and which gives me a fun meal or some nice cakes to treat to my friends. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorite things, uh, biking around Amsterdam and picking up these uh, almost wasted food items. Yeah, I've also used Too Good To Go when I was living in Amsterdam, and I think it is a great concept, and I recommend it to everyone listening. Was there one thing or one person that inspired you to have a passion for e-mobility? Yeah, yeah I would have to uh, mention Marcel Bulthuis because it was him. He runs electricmotorcycles.nl. And if I wouldn't have won this day on the electric motorbike and connected to Fastnet, yeah, I wouldn't be in in this interview. I think it's just, uh, yeah, it really opened my eyes to what's possible because he was already doing this years ago, renting out these two wheel monster vehicles that pretty much the world doesn't know about. Uh, you know, I, the Netherlands has more than 500,000 people with motorbikes, yet most of them don't even realize what's out there um so yeah i'm so excited for all of the things that are still uh, coming because this uh, this will get so common uh, in the future that is very clear to me okay final question and we ask all of our guests this is there anything you'd like to plug perhaps a future trip you're planning later this year or next year yeah i really hope that travel will open up uh, a Again, because I'm really looking forward to doing uh, new road trips. And yeah, every year I'm trying to do this uh, this Berlin Challenge. So I will have to find a way to either do the Berlin Challenge this year, but I will find an interesting uh, theme. But I'm also really looking forward to go way more east because, yeah, last year was such a, such a mess that yeah, I absolutely didn't get to do the trips that I wanted to. I, I was hoping to uh, to drive to Poland, um, and uh, and I also have friends in Romania that I really look forward to visiting by EV. Um, and then I was in a Dutch uh, podcast earlier this year where I mentioned that yeah I recently saw on the map that even Georgia had some uh, fast chargers up and running. So I thought yeah this this seems like the real the real challenge because. Yeah, then I will have no clue what to expect anymore. And I can just be on the road for a whole month, hopefully, and uh, just be finding fun people and fun chargers and uh, weird hidden supermarkets next to a forest where you have uh, viewpoints and, uh, and 20 kilowatt DC fast charging for free. Who knows? So, yeah, I there's many places. And I also got an invitation to visit the fast charging factory in Portugal. So uh, that's absolutely high on the list. Amazing. Thanks for joining the podcast, Felix. Yes. Thank you for inviting me, Ryan. It was a big, big pleasure. It was fascinating to welcome Felix to the podcast to discuss all things EVs, including his blog, electricfelix.com, the role of charge cards in planning an EV road trip, and some of the exciting trips Felix has undertaken in electric vehicles. We'll be back for another episode soon. Revolution Conference 2021 is just 183 days away. Register today at revolutionconference.com.